This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 48 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, November 28th, 1908. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago as we read. The first section in the November 28th Wardsman was the Graniteville section. G.E. Freeman, a former principal of the Sergeant School here and now located in a similar position in Lexington, has been a recent guest of Mr. and Mrs. Frank L. Furbush in this village. Mr. Freeman, during his brief visit here, also called on many of his old friends. A large sign painted in black and gold with the words Sergeant School has recently been placed on the local school building, which adds greatly to the attractiveness of this edifice. Of course, that building is still uh, in use in Westford. It sits right behind the Methodist Church and is, uh, has apartments in it, I think, for elderly housing. Business still continues to be good in all branches of industry here, and the mills and shops were only closed on Thanksgiving Day. The first annual ball of John Edwards Hose Company, Westford Fire Department, will be held in Abbott's Hall, Forge Village, Friday evening, December 11th. Music by the Grange Orchestra. The fortnightly club of North Westford held a well-attended meeting in the district school building Uh, That was the Wright Lion School at 125 and 127 Groton Road, Friday of last week. In the absence of the president, the meeting was called to order by Carl Wright, past president, at 8 o'clock. After the secretary had read the report of the previous meeting, the following pleasing program was given. Selection by the Albion Orchestra, reading Mrs. W. Wyman, recitation, The Silk Pajamas, Miss Grace Robinson, Song, Someone Here, Someone Is Waiting For Me, Miss Carrie Prynne, Recitation, Who Made the Speech, Miss Maud Robinson, Song, Mrs. Emily Blodgett with Violin Obligato by Arthur Blodgett, Selection by the Orchestra, um, Bone Solo by Joe Wall. The Albion Orchestra then closed the evening's entertainment with several popular airs that proved to be very enjoyable to the many present. After the entertainment, a short business meeting was held during which plans were formulated for the next order of exercises and debate that is to be held in two weeks. The debate spoken of promises to be the real thing, the subject and principles which have not yet been decided upon. This will be announced before the all-important night so that all may be in position to pick their favorite speakers and at the same time form some opinion of the question to be discussed. The members of the Holy Name Society of St. Catherine's Church, through its committee composed of Henry Provost, James O'Brien, and John F. Cavanaugh, recently presented James McTeague of North Chelmsford a box of cigars as a slight token of a appreciation for his able assistance in drilling the members of the local society for the Holy Name Parade that was held in Boston a short time ago. It was certainly very kind of Mr. McTeague to help out the people up here, and his kindness is deeply appreciated, not only by the members of the Holy Name Society, but by the parishioners of St. Catherine's Church as well. The next section is the About Town section. J. Willard Fletcher is having built a new grain house at Westford Station, 26 by 60 feet. It is encouraging to see the profits of the grain business become invested in so tangible and taxable a way. Pearl Harmon, as carpenter, is helping this, pro- helping this prosperity take form. Samuel M. Hutchins, who for many years lived on the snow farm opposite Fairview Cemetery, died at his home on Parker Street, Lowell, Wednesday afternoon of Bright's disease. The funeral was from his home on Friday afternoon and burial was in Fairview Cemetery, Westford. George C. Moore, who controls the water at Namnesset Pond, has nearly completed building a new dam at the outlet and lowering the bed of the brook that flows to Stony Brook. 
This means lower water at the pond if necessary. The severe drought this summer made several small islands visible. Lowering it much more will make it all island within, without any water surrounding it. Nelson Conant of Lowell, of Littleton, of well and favorably known Apple King notoriety, has been perambulating the town about at eight miles an hour basis for buying apples. Several small lots in the Stony Brook Valley have received marching orders for Europe and will leave Westford Station next week. Thanks, of course, because this is Thanksgiving week, and thanks, of course, because these European orders, though small, help to balance that potato crop that got hit so hard with the drought as to forget its name, so bad that it rounded up at harvest time one-third witchgrass, one-third wireworms, one-third white grubs, and the rest potatoes. Uh, obviously not very many potatoes. It's interesting that Westford was shipping apples to Europe in November. Jesse Walkton Bell has added another Bell, uh, B-E-L-L, the surname. Her name is Jean E. She was born November 12, 1908, though it's not given in the article. To her chime of bells, um, children named Bell, some kind of music, that is another girl, as all previous bells, and like its elder, Elder, this new arrival, Bell, is a Bell, B-E-L-L-E. -E. The variety producing bass music would have fetched an added smile. That is, a boy. Uh, Jesse was married to Robert John Bell, and they, they had uh, four girls before getting a boy, and ended up with five girls and three boys. So Mr. Bell got his wish, I guess, for the bass music. The Fortnightly Club will hold its next meeting Friday evening, December 4th, at the Little Red Schoolhouse, again the Wright and Lyon Schoolhouse on Groton Road, near Gould Road. The Spalding Light Cavalry Association, like all military companies, was organized for the emergencies of war, but by this new departure and incorporation it has become for the emergencies of peace. It is well that the Spalding Light Cavalry Association has incorporated incorporated itself so firmly and wisely under the new command right wheel into line for social, literary, and fraternal purposes. This is a way of fulfilling the ancient prophecy, quote, they shall beat their spears into pruning hooks and their swords into plowshares, which appears in both Isaiah chapter 2 verse 4 and Micah chapter 4 verse 3. And he's referring to the the uh, spalling uh, light uh, Cavalry Association becoming incorporated, I, I believe. How wisely grand if the old historic Academy of Tender Memories could have been utilized in a literary way to help our barren lives and thus have saved it from being thrust into the association of uncongenial surroundings without even a gravestone of remembrance. He's referring to Westford Academy in July of 1907, Henry O. Kyes had purchased and moved the original Westford Academy building from its original site on Boston Road across from the Westford Common to its present site where it serves as the Westford Museum. The next section is called Entertainment. After being self-sacrificingly sidetracked to allow various entertainments first rights to the public, the management of the Westford, West Chelmsford play, the Village Post Office, have decided to take to the main line as a through express mail, regardless of danger signals, and open the post office to the public at Marshalls Hall on Westford, West Chelmsford Territory on Wednesday, December 9th. So keep ye clear of the main line, all ye slow-rated local freights, and all other infringements of high rate of speed. For this post office omnibus, carrying 40 actors, has orders not to reverse for anything this side of the meeting house on Tadmuck Hill. As Marshall's Hall is on the town line, Westford Corner will furnish about half the actors to represent the commonwealth of the town, furnishing a fool, a stutterer, and a farmer, and a lot of other queer-acting critters. He doesn't say who these fool, stutterer, and farmer are, but I'm guessing that the farmer is Sam Taylor himself. The next section is the center section. 
For a village of its size, there have been an unusual number of movings this fall. Those who have already changed their abiding place have been duly chronicled in our weekly column, and this week the Alfred W. Hartfords have moved into the pretty new house on Depot Street, just completed by Frank C. Drew. Warren E. Karkin and his mother, Mrs. Nellie Karkin, have moved into the house made vacant by the Hartfords. Mary Morin, our village nurse, and her sister, Mrs. Isles, moved the first of the week into the house recently purchased by them, made vacant by the Karkins. The Donald Camerons have gone for their usual winter sojourn in Lowell. About 50 members of Westford Grange went over to Chelmsford Grange last week Thursday evening for friendly visitation and to witness the sort of degree work done by this Grange, more especially the third degree as exemplified by the ladies' degree staff. This was especially fine, and the visiting members, many who are in a staff of their own, were highly pleased and learned much. The fourth degree work by the regular officers was also done in an able manner. A fine supper was served to fully 200. Frank E. Miller and Fred A. Smith each drove a barge to carry the Westford members, besides many going in their own teams. Charles L. Hildreth, who has been ill for some weeks, is at this writing quite, quite comfortable, able to sit up a little each day. J. Herbert Fletcher secured a trophy of his huntsman skill in the shape of a fine, large fox one day last week on the northerly slope of Tadmuck Hill. The pupils in the new school building, that is the William E. Frost School, made a Thanksgiving offering of, for some worthy children in Boston this last week. Each one was asked to give only what they felt willing and able and their parents readily sanctioned, but they entered with much zest into the enterprise and a goodly collection of fruit, vegetables, nuts, canned goods, and even popcorn was carefully packed by Charles O. Prescott and sent to its destination. Owing to objections made by the Brookside Mill help, the 530 electric, which has been in the habit of waiting for the train, which leaves Lowell shortly after five, has stopped making this few minutes wait and train passengers have to wait for the next car. This has been a great convenience to some all the time and to others a part of the time, and an effort will be made to see if the electric people will not reconsider their decision. The many Westford friends of Miss Lena H. Fletcher will be interested to learn of her marriage on November 22nd in Somerville to Gregory Henry Clark of West Somerville, where they will make their home. There was an excellent Thanksgiving service at the Congregational Church Sunday morning. Sermon, responses, prayer, and music were all in direct harmony with the spirit of the day. The pulpit was prettily trimmed with bittersweet berries and oak branches. The Christian Endeavor meeting was conducted by Mrs. Leonard W. Wheeler, subject, Songs of the Heart, Gratitude, and How to Express It. The schools closed Wednesday for a four weeks recess. Miss Bartlett of the Academy went to her home in Kingston, New Hampshire. Miss Babbitt to Fitchburg. Miss Grant at the other school went to her home in Gloucester, and Miss Cushing to Southboro. The two RFD carriers had a holiday Thanksgiving Day, no mail being delivered on their routes that day. The second in the series of lectures and entertainments under the auspices of the Grange took place at Town Hall Monday night when a fair-sized audience assembled to hear George S. Ladd, past master of the State Grange, in his excellent lecture, quote, Across the Continent, end quote. He portrayed many interesting facts of a recent trip to Portland, Oregon, and back, especially emphasizing the agricultural features in various localities. The next section is called The Club. The Tadmuck Club held an interesting meeting in Library Hall Tuesday afternoon. It was a real roundtable discussion in charge of the president, Miss Loker. The following topics were under consideration. One, or first, resolved that our club will be more successful if we place less dependence on outside talent. And two, resolved that a high school training a high school training is of supreme value to the average child, end quote. 
Mrs. Benjamin H. Bailey sustained the negative of the first question and Miss Ruth Fisher the affirmative, and they were as bright and clear in clear cut in their respective positions as well could be. On the second question, Mrs. Alice Lambert gave a good argument for the affirmative and Miss Edith Foster an able paper for the negative. Mrs. Helen K. Frost, you know, she was the widow of uh, William Frost, the former principal of Westford Academy and the man who the Frost School is named after. M Mrs. Helen K. Frost also contributed a short paper for the affirmative. Both topics were followed by discussion. The club membership feel that the afternoon's plan was so successfully sustained and carried out that it would bear repetition with different topics on a future program. The next meeting will be a musicale in charge of the Mrs. Gertrude and Julia Fletcher. These are the two daughters of uh, Captain Sherman H. Fletcher who lived at 33 Main Street. And on account of securing a soloist who is unable to come on the date set, December 8th, the meeting will be postponed one week, taking place December 15th at the Congregational Vestry. The next section is called Visitors. Among the guests in town for the Thanksgiving holiday were A.E. Prescott at Miss Clara Prescott's, Lawrence N. Wright and Miss Grace F. Bauer at Reverend Charles P. Marshall's, James Kimball at the Luce Homestead, Mr. and Mrs. Harry Prescott at Mrs. Francis Prescott's, Julia Ann and Marion Hall at Harrison B. Hall's, Jenny Chandler at Mrs. John B. Fletcher's, Mrs. Helen R. Layton and Francis at Mrs. C.H. Fletcher's, Mr. and Mrs. Fred A. Hildreth, Mrs. Kate Allen and Catherine at Herbert V. Hildreth's. So family visited uh, uh, other family members as in uh, 100 years ago as we do today at Thanksgiving. There were large family gatherings at Sherman H. Fletcher's, John M. Fletcher's, Mrs. Francis Prescott's, George Haywood's, and Mrs. Alva Alvin Fisher's. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending November 28th, 1908. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.